You're listening to Women's Cricket Chat with Anna and Alex. Coming up on today's podcast, we've got a real legend of the game in former England cricket captain Claire Connor. Now, Claire was captain during the momentous 2005 Ashes and since leaving the game is now managing director of women's cricket for the ECB. But not only that, she is the first female MCC president in its 233 year history. Hannah, Georgie and I talked to Claire about her time playing, her post-playing career, about her role with the MCC and how Women's Big Cricket Month came about. I was listening to the Game Changers podcast with Sue and Sliss that you recorded back in 2019 now and one of the questions is, you know, it's always the obvious question of how do you get involved with cricket and stuff like that and you spoke about the 1993 World Cup which was obviously monumentous for England, they won on home soil, but who inspired you in that squad to continue that love of cricket and want you to, you know, go and play for England yourself? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, Hannah, because the the honest truth of it is that I could barely have told you any of those names at the time. And kind of therein lies, you know, probably a problem, if you like, then around that kind of era in terms of the, I suppose, the lack of knowledge and exposure of those amazing role models at the time, um, you know, who were, you know, the best in the world in the women's game by, by lifting that World Cup in 1993 at Lord's against New Zealand but also I suppose you know in a in a good way I that's a it's a good indicator of of the progress that probably the women's game has seen in the last gosh how many years is that nearly 30 years I suppose so you know my role models growing up my my heroes my inspirations were were, were virtually all male you know I, I also looked to in in tennis I looked to Martina Navratilova and Steffi Graf and I knew a few, you know, I knew the names of a couple of the England women's cricket team, but it was only really around that time that I got sort of turned on to or had my eyes open to the fact that this existed. You know, I'd grown up as a little girl around men's cricket clubs, men's players, boys players, all my formative experiences were in boys teams. I'd kind of grown up in this I had a lovely childhood um, growing up essentially at my dad's cricket club in, in, in Sussex in the South Downs, of sort of following him around and then starting to play the game in boys teams. And my heroes in cricket were Ian Botham, Alex Stewart, Steve Waugh. You know, I spent hours watch, re- watching replays of the 1981 uh, Men's Ashes series, Botham's Ashes, Headingley, all of that. So I think it was only around the early 90s and that 1993 Women's World Cup final where I I suddenly thought, okay, that's that's what I've got to do. Because I I think until that age or or slightly younger in a really kind of naive sense, because I'd done well in boys cricket and I didn't know much about the existence of women's cricket, I kind of thought, well, I'm going to carry on playing men's cricket. Why, why wouldn't I? Because no one's told me so far that I'm not good enough. And my inclusion in various teams, you know, playing boys first 11 cricket at school, playing in men's teams in my, you know, as, as, a, as a teenager made me believe that, OK, well, I'm just going to carry on here. And that was a naive kind of girlhood, girlhood sort of fantasy, I suppose. It was around that time that very, very quickly I got into women's cricket. I played for Sussex women and I very, very quickly, around the same time as Charlotte Edwards, actually, who I know you've spoken to already, it was around that time that we both got picked for Junior England, the Junior England girls set up. And then within two and a half years of that Women's World Cup final, I I I got picked for England women. Uh, So it was very quick, sort of sudden entry and sort of explosion into the women's game and and realising, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And so you say you started out playing in all those different boys' sides when you were younger. Were there ever any negative attitudes to you turning up? Did you sort of get those looks from the boys being like, a girl has turned up to play? And then you just sort of, or did that sort of spur you on to turn up and be like, look, I'm really going to prove to them that I'm not just here as a girl on the team. I'm I'm going to play better than all of them, really. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question, Georgie, because... With hindsight and knowing what I know now and seeing the kind of the world change and women's sport change, with hindsight, I think I should have felt more odd and more of an outsider than I did. 
you know, I was the only girl for many years playing in boys teams in Sussex, whether that was for my club, Preston Nomads, uh, from the age of nine, or at my school, Brighton College Prep School from the age of nine. And I played in those boys teams without another girl in sight for about, well, throughout those, those teams, in those teams, there was never another girl. So six, seven, eight years. And I didn't encounter another girl in any of the opposition teams either at club level or school level. So when I look back and I kind of, you know, as, as kind of the person that I am now, I think, gosh, you know, I, I think I must have surely, Claire, you felt odd or you felt completely in the minority and that it was awkward or you must have been anxious. And I wasn't. And I think, you know, I don't remember feeling that way at all. And I feel so grateful that I must have, you know, I had the kind of unconditional support of my family and my coaches and my teachers and people at my cricket club but also I didn't come across in the opposition teams that you ask about Georgie I didn't come across any kind of sexist or nasty judgmental attitudes which is amazing isn't it really really amazing so and I think unless I've sort of filtered them out because you know they weren't there were some nice moments and I've just kind of filtered them out I, I had the you know the occasional comment about but but nothing nothing that was really nasty or that made me feel gosh you know I feel I feel I feel really kind of a, a real outsider here and I think probably the other thing was that if you think about being in the same environment for year up year after year you come up again I came up against the same boys players in teams each year so once they'd seen me maybe once or twice it was normal for them to see me in the same way that it was normal for me to be in those teams. I think that's what it's all about, really normalising that, you know, girls and women can play cricket. I wanted to shift it forward slightly to 1995 and uh, your ODI debut. You made your ODI debut against Denmark. What was it like to make your debut against a team like Denmark, where cricket's not particularly well known and did you have many people crowds watching or was this a time where people were still sort of finding their feet with women's cricket? Yeah, I, so my, you're right, my debut was, was against Denmark in Ireland. I was uh, just coming to the end of my gap year. So I was 18, soon to be 19, and I was about to start university um, to read English at Manchester. And it was a I was shocked to be selected. It was, as I've already explained, it was all quite quick and I wasn't expecting to be selected. It was, we were playing in the European Cup and uh, what was, what what was, so that what had happened then was we'd won this, the World Cup in 1993, I'd watched that happen. And then very, you know, very sadly, there had been no international women's cricket between that World Cup win and then the European Cup in 1995. Or, or very, or I don't think there had been anyway. I don't think there, I, I'm pretty sure that there hadn't been any um, for England. And so there'd been this sort of hiatus and 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 probably, you know, for, for those players at the time who were more established, that European Cup was a kind of almost a, a good way to kind of kickstart international women's cricket again for the England women's team. We won that tournament comfortably. And no, there was, there was very little interest in, in that competition. It, um, it, it felt, you know, it didn't feel, you know, it felt special to me. You know, I was very proud, it, but it, it certainly wasn't the same experience as four or five months later going to India for my first, if you like, big tour, which was three te- a three test match tour, obviously no T20s, three test matches and five ODIs. And that was a seven or eight week tour where we took in a lot of the country, you know, we went, we traveled all all over India in some remarkable ways, overnight train journeys, eight hour bus rides through kind of sort of, you know, steep Indian terrain. And and, and that was a a very different experience. Obviously that was, that was a real feeling of, wow, this is an international cricket tour. And, you know, I had nothing really to compare it to because the Island trip had been for kind of five or six days for that European Cup. That India tour was something else, you know, as I say, I'd just started university. So I'd done a month at university and then had to sort of withdraw to go on this tour. We had to pay our way. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure other uh, cricketers 
cricketers before me have talked about this you know we 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 had to pay pay a contribution towards that tour pay for our blazers pay pay for some of our kit contribution towards our airfares but it was an incredible experience and at some some grounds we had 15 20,000 people which you know was just completely overwhelming for me personally it wasn't a, a hugely successful tour i i did make my test debut in in hyderabad and i remember taking my my uh, my first wicket in that um, test wicket and, and feeling very emotional. But I, I got a finger injury during the tour. I was also in hospital with a bout of dysentery. So it was a it was a tumultuous tour, but kind of unforgettable. You know, it was I was you know it was literally wow, this is international cricket and playing in India and seeing the fanaticism. I'd you know I'd seen it on the TV in the men's game, but to experience it and to to be playing alongside some of those World Cup winners like Karen Smithies, Joe Chamberlain, Jeanette Britton, you know, that was, you know, that was an incredible, incredible first big tour. Honestly, like playing in India, it's just hard for us to kind of understand because, you know, we see all the time that, you know, women's cricket is packaged up as this big new idea and, you know, trying to get fans to the stadiums and all that kind of stuff is it feels like it's, you know, still work in progress, but it has happened in the past and, you know, you've had big crowds and it's nothing new. But what was it like taking over the captaincy from Karen Smithies back when you were just 24? Yeah, it was it was the biggest honour, you know, of of my career, I think. So from that in that regard, it was, uh, it, you know, it was, you know, the start of six years as England captain that was the most incredible journey the circumstances in which I took over the captain were very difficult, though. Um, it was a real baptism of fire because, you know, as you say, I was young. I'd had a lot of captaincy experience, I suppose, through obviously not at that level, but I had had lots of captaincy experience with Sussex. But those circumstances were very testing because we were midway through a tour. Um, we were on a big tour of Australia and New Zealand, and we'd already had three or four weeks of some quite humiliating defeats in Australia some really we'd lost by some massive margins and our squad was quite divided at the time because we were you know defeat those kind of defeats like that really lay you bare and if you're not strong as a team and if you're you know if you haven't got kind of high levels of sort of trust and openness and yeah you, you know those are very difficult times and so you know we had a bit of a blame culture the bat, the bat the batters were blaming the bowlers the bowlers were blaming the batters and and poor Karen Smithies who'd you know who'd been England captain by then for I think perhaps 10 maybe 12 maybe 12 years I, I think you know been a World Cup winner you know she it, it you know she it was you know it was it was evident that you know, she didn't know what to do to, to try to repair kind of our, our our squad kind of culture or or performances really. So it was they were they were challenging times. Luckily, I'm really pleased I had a very good relationship with Karen. So it didn't kind of it didn't divide us when obviously the cap, you know, when she 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 relinquished the captaincy and I was asked to take over midway through that tour and then take on the captaincy in New Zealand. So it was this kind of a double-edged sword, really, of an, an incredible honour for me personally and a real, you know, I was deeply driven to, to, to do it and to, 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 to immediately try to do whatever I could to, to help the squad from a, from a pretty low place, really. But it, but it was a double-edged sword also because of the, those circumstances. Um, and I felt, you know, very sorry for Karen. But it was a, a kind of a, a I think the, it was a, it was a, an important moment for us as a group and, you know, thereafter, you know, luckily, not luckily, I suppose, but we, you know, we were able to, we were able to grow and develop as a squad from there. And some players came in like Nikki Shaw, Dawn Holden, Sarah Collier, probably around that time. And a few of the more senior players, you know, took their, uh, took their decision to retire and, and we had and we and we started to grow and develop but those situations are never easy and having been england captain you've obviously experienced a lot of highs and lows what for you personally has been your proudest moment as england captain my proudest moment as england captain was regaining the ashes um, after 42 years in 2000 and in 2005 and i think it was my proudest moment 
not so much about not so much because it was um the 40 you know kind of ending that 42 year drought from an ashes perspective but more so because I played for England by then for 10 years and never beaten Australia in in any in any form of the game so I had I think it was my proudest moment to see our players to see my, my I say my players, our players experience that and to realise that finally over that period we had closed the gap and that I, it felt that that kind of domination of Australia was over. And I mean, they were a formidable team, like, you know, Belinda Clark, Fitzpatrick, Lisa Kitely, Price, uh, Olivia Mano, the leg spinner, Karen Rolton, I mean, they, they, were, they were an amazing team. And I think even, even if you put them into this era, um, which is obviously very different in terms of professionalization, skill, power, athleticism, I think they would, they would, they would compete seriously well. Whereas if you put the team I was captain of into this era, I don't think, I don't think you could say that so much. So you know they were they were an amazing team and um so so i think to end that era of sort of domination and and then what was lovely for me as captain was to see players our players almost stand a few inches taller and you know put their shoulders back and realize that they belonged at the top of the world game and that was the first time I think we could say that in, in my spell as a, an England player for 10 years. And certainly it was the first time as captain after six years of being captain that I could sort of finally sort of breathe, breathe, you know, breathe differently and think, yeah, we've, we've done something really special. And you can't think of the 2005 Ashes without thinking about the celebrations on both sides, men and women. Maybe we saw a little bit more of the male celebrations with a bit of this going on. But what was it like to be at Downing Street on that day celebrating both the male and the female achievements at the same time? Yeah, I, it was um, It was also, so it, I think it's a really important question because I think it was the first time ever in the journey of women's cricket that uh, that we we were part of some that kind of almost that national sporting consciousness moment with that Trafalgar Square open pop open top bus ride Jerusalem Downing Street all of the photos and the experience of that I think you know kind of was amazing to be part of obviously and completely unforgettable. But I think it it was an important moment in in our evolution and in our journey as an international sports team, women's team, because of that integrated approach to celebration. And I think, and all credit, you know, then to those the decision makers at the ECB for turning that around so quickly, because it was it was as you know, it was the day after the men finished at the Oval. For us, it was a two or three weeks, perhaps after our ashes had finished. So, you know, it was, I think it was, it was brilliant. It was quite groundbreaking for sport to say, okay, this has been an England men's and women's ashes triumph. Yes, the women finished three weeks ago. And, you know, the easy option then would have been to not include us in that day that followed the men's, the culmination of the men's ashes at the Oval. So, I think it was a, a really important day for, and a launch pad, if you like, for what started to happen for me, the women's game from there. You know, there's key moments in time that you can pick on and, and say, well, that was important for that reason. And, you know, that's when contracts came in, or that's when, you know, Vodafone, for example, started sponsoring both England men and women. And, the, and so you can pick out key sort of, tangible actions and decisions throughout the years but I think Georgie that day uh, in London in September 2005 was was one of the most significant and obviously retiring 
just shortly after that, it's, you know, what a high to end on, to be fair. But moving across now into your post-playing career and working within the UCB, obviously you had a little bit of time out. And then was it Hugh Morris offered you up your first um, ECB job? So tell us a little bit about that and then perhaps how captaincy has allowed you to become the leader you are off the pitch. Yeah, so I retired, as you say, in early 2006. And I think, firstly, just on my retirement, I feel so blessed that it was my decision. You know, it's, it's I think, probably a rarity um, in, in professional, not that I was, but professional slash international sport. And I, it was a very, very difficult decision, um, one that I really wrestled with and shed a few tears over, but was made sort of more bearable and to, to walk away from, you know, who, you know, how do you walk away from playing for your country? It's damn difficult. But I, it was made more bearable and more um, manageable knowing that Charlotte Edwards was like literally so ready to, 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 to take it on and take the team forward. You know, I'd become probably a bit of a stale voice by then, maybe. You know, there's only so, so long you can listen to the same team talks and the same voice. And I was also, you know, pretty tired and worn out by then. And it was, uh, it was brilliant, you know, to be able to, to hand on something that had been so important to me personally, to be able to hand that on, to pass it on to, to Lottie, who obviously was a, a very good friend as well as teammate. Um, so that's the first thing I'd say on that on that moment. Then, as you say, I went, you know, I, I went back to teaching to my the career that had kind of, if you like, underpinned my England cricket career. I'd been an England English teacher and I, I went back to, to Brighton College to teach English after that in, in after the ashes in end of 2005 and and took on some other responsibilities, leadership roles, I suppose, within the school. I became head of PR and marketing for the school. And I also took on a house mistress role um, for a day, a girl's day house at Brighton College. So, you know, started immediately to, you know, in, in terms of leaving the, the England captaincy, I took on other leadership roles, which, you know, not everyone has the chance to do in sport because they haven't had a dual career. So that was, I was lucky to have those um, and did that for a couple of years. And then, as you say, he, Hugh Morris gave me a call um, from the ECB. He'd, I'd, I'd forged a good working relationship with Hugh when I was England captain. He was my main go-to person. And if you like, I was answerable, even though I wasn't an employee of the ECB then. I was accountable to Hugh Morris in his role as managing director of England cricket or whatever he was called at that point. I think he had a couple of different job titles. So I'd never envisaged leaving teaching. Um, I've said this lots of times, you know, I loved it. And again, you know, theme of the theme of lots of, when I talk about my career, you know, there's a real theme of, of, of gratitude because I'd had a career in teaching that I'd adored. English was my other passion other than cricket, I suppose, you know, having read English at university. And so it was a really difficult decision to leave teaching and leave the teaching world and move into cricket administration. I'd never, I'd never really contemplated doing that. Anyway, um, I did it. And I suppose the, it's, it's to cut a, a lot of years down, you know, I haven't looked back. It was very different time 12 years ago, the ECB, different probably priorities then, certainly Coming, in, coming into a senior role at the ECB, it wasn't daunting so much in terms of leadership. I suppose it was really, I don't know. It, what was daunting about it was that there was, I didn't have a team. I didn't have a strategy. I didn't have a sense of really understanding where the ECB wanted to go with the women's game. We didn't have, you know, full tie. As I say, didn't, I, we had so little. So I suppose the challenge and the daunting prospect was right how, and I suppose that is a leadership challenge, is how do I build this? What, where do we need to start? Where do we need to prioritise? How do we influence the, the board for more budget, for more focus, for more resource, and frankly, for more integration? Because as you'll, you'll all be aware, you know, the ECB, you know, had only, hadn't even the women's game hadn't even been under the auspices of the ECB for very long by then. So, you know, maybe only seven years or something. So it was about building a, an infrastructure, influencing colleagues, influencing the board. Um, and I suppose those are, those, abs those are absolutely leadership skills that 
you know, I'd never, I'd never had to call on before. Um, I'd never done that before, obviously, you know, I'd, yes, I'd captained the England women's cricket team and I'd had a little bit of leadership experience, as I say, at Brighton College, but, you know, my day job had been teaching Hamlet and, I don't know, First World War poetry. It wasn't, how do I build a, an infrastructure for, for, for a sport at a national governing body? Um, but it was an, it's been an ama- amazing, amazing time. Real roller coaster, as you can imagine, but certainly more, more highs than lows. And perhaps you could draw on some of that First World War poetry in your leadership role. <laughs> you never know. Maybe Resilience. It's all at school for a reason. But on the topic of leadership roles, we can't ignore that you have, were named the first female president of the MCC in its 233-year history back in 2020. Obviously, then you've had to wait an extra 12 months, you know, but what is one year in 233 for an iconic moment in the history of the women's game and you said at your appointment that you first visited Lords age nine and women weren't even allowed in the long room at that time so it's been quite a change and then there was a record number of female members in 2019 so what is it that you're looking to do in this role and how are you going to move it forward for women in the game and women as part of the MCC? Yeah, it, 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 is, it is such, you know, that is a, num- a lot, long time, isn't it? So it, it, feels like, it feels like the most re- incredible honour and opportunity and recognition and I'm absolutely over the moon to, to have been given it. You know, when one of you, I think, asked me, you know, about the England captaincy and was that my most sort of my proudest moment I think I think this comes a very very a very close second to being uh being being named England captain look the yeah it's the MCC is obviously such an influential institution people look to it in this country um within cricket and within sport and and around the world it's got influence and standing and a reputation that is largely good, I would say, largely positive. But there's no doubt that an institution that is that old and has got so much history behind it, um, like any institution or organisation, you know, there's there's lots that is still that is still rooted in the past. And you know, like anything, I think it's working out and this won't be, you know, certainly I won't be able to do it in a year, but hopefully I can play a small part, is working out what parts of your history and tradition you want to preserve and why and and where, where kind of some change and accelerated change is needed and why. And I think, you know, hopefully I can bring some of my experience at the ECB to bear in that regard because I've I've sort of been through that to a degree um, and and been thinking that way. I think I've got a really unique and privileged opportunity because I think I'm the first person to be the MCC president who has had a career in cricket administration. And and when I say that, you know, that's that's 90% ECB, but also I've got a lot of ICC experiences as well now. So hopefully I can bring all of that to bear and I can make all of that work really coherently because I will go into the MCC president role this October still with my ECB assuming I'm still in a job um, still still in my ECB role and also wearing an ICC hat as well so there'll be there'll probably be some tricky moments because of that frankly there might be some some moments where there's a bit of conflict of interest and and that will require you know some some skill at times I'm sure to to navigate that. But but the 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 simple answer is it's just an amazing opportunity to be involved with with the club. You know it, it is at the end of the day it's got this huge name and brand. It's a cricket club. It just happens to have nearly twenty thousand members and a global reach. But it also has the opportunity to do real good. You know because something of that size and 
you know, the, the sort of the force behind it, it, it's got the power to do such good work, the MCC, in the community here. It's doing amazing work through its foundation. I'm a trustee of the MCC Foundation, which is its charitable arm. And that's about, and that's got real inclusion and diversity at its core, the MCC Foundation work around hub, the hubs, over 60 hubs are up and down the country with a real focus on girls, getting more opportunity from hard to reach communities or diverse communities, less, less privileged communities, taking cricket to them, giving them the chance to get involved in teams and talent pathways where previously they might, might not. But we've also got the chance to do some amazing work overseas. So the MCC Foundation has set up two really exciting projects, one in Nepal and one in Lebanon. The one in, in the Lebanon particularly is taking cricket to, to Syrian refugee camps and the, the, the interest in girl, for, from girls in those, in those projects is amazing and inspiring. And I can't wait to hopefully go and see them in person as MTC president and, and, and you know, lend whatever support I can to what, what the club is trying to do there. So I know that's quite a long answer, but I think it warrants it because it's, you know, it's, it's about this, this amazing history and tradition, but it's also about the forward thinking, inclusive work that the MCC can do for the game and for, uh, for broadening the reach of the MCC and broadening the, the access to cricket through the MCC. And we can't have you on without talking about Women's Big Cricket Month. No, you um, can't. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's such a wonderful idea in just getting more people involved, getting them talking about women's cricket. And with it being in its second year, for some of our listeners who may not know what it is, how did the idea come about? The idea came about during the pandemic last year. So, you know, I think it's one of the... The handful of amazing things that have come out of a very, very difficult um, and, and challenging and sad time. So for us last year, it was about, OK, you know, the pandemic's kind of been raging for six months. We've seen, you know, we've had so little opportunity to shine a light on the women's game domestically or recreationally or internationally. And um, I remember our first project meeting about it on this, you know, on Teams or Zoom or how, whatever it was. And um, at first it was going to be Women's Big Cricket Weekend. And then we were like, no, I nearly swore then, I better not swear. We were like, no, no we're not going to do that. We're, um, we're going to build a month here. We're going to work with the game, the, the club game and the domestic game. Uh, it was around the, the launch of the Rachel Hayo Flint Trophy. It was around getting the West Indies women over on a charter flight from the Caribbean. It was around, OK, you know, we're seeing the recreational game being able to be played again. Let's build a whole month around uh, women's and girls cricket and really gal try and galvanise people behind it. And it was a really it was it was a really um, a really a really lovely time. And we saw brilliant engagement through through the kind of through social media and ways in which we were able to communicate at the time so we thought okay we're going to do that again with you know less restrictions and um and yeah so june is women's big cricket month um we've got uh, a target of 800 events um being uh, staged across across the month we're two-thirds of the way there it's about trying to connect people as, 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 as per last year at every, at every level of the game and to really try and shine a spotlight, particularly, I think, since, uh, you know, during the pandemic, one of, one of the successes we've managed to pull off is investing in a, a whole network of club development officers, which we've, we're investing in centrally. It's roughly an investment of a million pounds and it's investing in the county cricket boards to recruit a workforce of women's and girls specific club development officers. Uh, so with that real dedicated focus. So we've got this amazing sort of mini army now of, of over 50 who are operating up and down the country, really trying to drive the sustainability of women's and girls club, club sections. So I think Women's Big Cricket Month is, is massively about them, but it's also obviously about driving awareness of the 100, which starts in just under a month, just over a month's time with that opening opening game being a women's standalone game at the at the Oval. Um, so it's about driving awareness and, and ticket sales um, for, for the start of that competition. 
It's also about our domestic game um, and the Rachel Hale Flint Trophy, which is which is underway and which we've seen some amazing performances from that have been, you know, I think we've seen seven scores of over 280. We've seen five or six hundreds. Uh, we've seen a, a, an amazing hat trick from, from Emily Arlott, who's earned her, uh, her England selection on the back of that. So, you know, it's uh, and, and then, of course, it's about the start of the England uh, se- uh, series against India, who arrived with the in- Indian men's team on a charter flight. Uh, and they're safely stowed down at the Aegeus Bowl at the moment with no COVID cases, which is amazing, and getting ready to transfer to Bristol for the start of the women's series. So, yeah, it's a big month. Um, thanks for asking about it, because it's, uh, it's great to be able to give it a real push. And, and well done to everyone across the game who's um, who's focusing on it this month. Amazing. And we have to wrap up here, unfortunately, Claire, because you do have to shoot off to another meeting. But one of the just final comments that I wanted to leave this episode on is I love the fact that former players talk about leaving the game in a better place. And that is really kind of shone through with this interview with yourself and everything that you've done to grow the game in the way you have in these last like over 10 years now, isn't it? Professional contracts, 2014, 2020, the Kia Super League, Rachel Hayho Flint Trophy, Women's Big Cricket Month and everything else that you have done to make women's cricket more inclusive. Well, cricket as a whole, isn't it? To make cricket more inclusive for women. So a huge thank you for sparing some time to chat to us. And we really do appreciate it because it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. And look, well done to you. Well done to you for giving your time and energy to, to doing this, because it's uh, the more voices and the more conversations at every level, the better. So thank you. Oh, well, look, really, honestly, well done. You know, uh, it's it's great to see this emerging out of, you know, it's another COVID. It's not a great phrase, maybe, but it's another kind of COVID silver lining thing, isn't it? Like Women's Big Cricket Month, I guess. Um, so look, if I can, maybe I'll let's chat again and do a review. Maybe, I don't know, ahead of England women going to Pakistan or ahead of the Ashes or something. We've got a huge, you, huge year coming up. And then yeah. you can take us along to any of these trips with you you know we'll just come along too Talk yeah let's uh, let's chat again yeah we could chat ar- again around the start of my mcc year and that that coincides really nicely with the england women's tour to pakistan yeah. which is historic we've never been there so from a kind of gender ag- gender agenda it's huge yeah. um so we really want we're really wanting to i think it's more than just a cricket tour you know yeah yeah okay thanks thank you so much. well done take care you bye Massive thank you to Claire for sitting down with Hannah, Georgie and I and talking all things women's cricket. It was an absolute honour and privilege to pick Claire's brain and find out more about what's happening in the future and seeing that good things are on the horizon for women's cricket. And to all our listeners, if you want to keep up to date with everything we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter at WCricketChat and on Instagram at Women's Cricket Chat. And if you want to give us a like on Facebook, we are Women's Cricket Chat. And if you wanted to give our personal Twitters a follow, Hannah is at HannahT1194 and I'm at Alex Jane Pereira. This has been Women's Cricket Chat. Tune in next time. Thank you.